again, bless this message, this meeting. Eternity is in the balance for someone that still has never heard how much you love them. Be magnified and glorified. Yes. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Evening, well, it's good to be back in God's house tonight, amen. I am rejoicing in what the Lord has done in our midst in these days of meeting. I want to thank you for allowing us to come and be a part of these nights. Man, God has met with us, and I'm ever mindful that he privileges us with his presence. And the Bible teaches us where two or three are gathered together, he'll be in the midst of them. But it doesn't teach that he will be manifested amongst them. He'll be there. But rather he chooses to reveal himself is the privilege of those that seek his face. Amen. And I sure thank God for what he's done. I want to I wanna say to the church, thank you for your kindness and your hospitality to our family this week. For every meal that's been provided downstairs in the fellowship hall. What a tremendous Tremendous blessing it has been, and uh, I've just enjoyed the fellowship. I like the fact that the preacher told you to spread out and sit with the missionaries and visit with us, and we like visiting with you. And we've met some precious folks this week, and we are so grateful for what God has done. Have enjoyed our time with the missionary families, as we always do. And when you come to the last night of a meeting, <coughs> there is a certain sadness on the last night of a meeting because you realize and you should realize this church that there's a good possibility that the families that have come through and been a part of your conference this week right here at University Baptist Church by the time uh, they may never have that opportunity to pass this way again and some are uh, in fact several that were here are nearing the end of their deputation two are nearing the end of their deputation trail to our uh, veteran missionaries that are um, uh, about to return to the field. And, uh, you know, time comes and time goes, and the average missionary on his furlough, it is an impossibility for him to be able to visit every one of his supporting churches on their schedule and make new contacts to secure the support that fills in the gaps that may be missing in his ministry that is an impossibility and so sometimes they're just not able to get by and several years may pass before you have the privilege of seeing some of these families again and uh, so there's a certain sadness that comes upon us at the end of a faith promise meeting a missions conference but God has chosen to meet with us this week and to remind us about his great plan and program to reach the world with the gospel the good news that Jesus saves Jesus saves, Jesus saves. I want you to find your place in 1 John tonight. If you'll look there, 1 John chapter number 3. Um, I'll pick up our reading there. Keep your Bibles open tonight. Uh, if the Lord will help us, I want to move rapidly, not for the sake of the time of the message, but because I want to cover a vast range of things tonight. If the Lord will help us just for a few moments uh, about this effective faith promise missions, effective faith promise missions. And uh, I trust the Lord will do just that, that he will help us uh, in our endeavors. First John chapter number 3, and we look at verse number 16 tonight from the Word of God. The Bible saying, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I want you to look at a phrase in verse number 17 as I try to find a place to jump into the text tonight. 
It just captures my attention. I believe that the Word of God is perfect in the originals. And I believe it's preserved in that perfection in our King James translation. Don't you? Amen. I knew I'm among friends. I just thought I'd state the position. But I said it for this purpose. What God said he meant. Amen. And what he meant he said. And it's really not left up for us to try to say, well, he really meant such and such. Because he didn't really mean such and such. If he'd have really meant such and such, he would have said such and such. Amen. And I want you to look, just look at this phrase with me tonight. And I think it'll help us. Here's what I'm interested in. I'm talking about some steps, and I've got four of them, if the Holy Ghost will help us to preach them. But I'm talking about some steps that will help us, or some things that will help us to have a faithful and effective faith promise mission program. You see, I understand that the conference ends tonight. And I understand that I, I'm assuming on Sunday, the pastor's going to collect the faith promise commitment cards and there'll be a tallying of those cards and we're Baptist folks so inevitably somebody will have the sniffles or somebody will have a family reunion to go to and so there'll be one or two absent and those will trickle in but within a couple of weeks time we'll have a solidified idea of how much the will of the people is to give through faith promise to worldwide missions over the coming year amen that weekly and monthly amounts that come in from each family and individual that come together collectively and give us an annualized budget so that we know, well, here's the pool of funds that our people, by faith, are willing to give so that the gospel can go around the world. Amen? And I realize that, but what I'm saying is this. You've been, uh, there's been a certain time of preparation. Preacher said he'd been preaching some on missions and reaching the world with the gospel and there's the days of the conference and there's the wrap up time where we make those commitments over the next week or so uh, but that's not a faith promise program that's the beginning of a faith promise program amen filling out our cards and making our commitments is the first step but it is the giving and the praying and the going that makes us have a effective Faith promise meeting, amen. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and sometimes I fear that we focus so much time and so much energy, and I am going to talk a little bit about money tonight, but we spend so much time and so much energy about our, in our missions conference talking about the finances of missions, and that's necessary. That's why every one of these missionaries came this week. They wanted to be enlarged by you, amen, according to our rule abundantly. That's what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. We know that we can't reach the world without finances. We know that missionaries can't go without monthly support. Amen. We understand those things. But I want you to understand that God's program in missions for University Baptist Church is bigger, it's larger than just a commitment on a card and some money given in an offering plate but it is a genuine heart for a world that's lost without God and it, in, and, and it becomes interwoven into every aspect and every ministry of our church. Amen? Now I'm not telling you how to operate your church. But I don't think there ought to be a Sunday school class that doesn't have some influence or is not influenced by missions. I don't believe there ought to be youth functions Brother Michael, that are not influenced and incorporate missions. To our friends in the Spanish ministry, I think that missions has to be incorporated into that ministry. And I'm so glad you've been in the preaching services. Amen. And, uh, and, and, and whether it be an outreach of the church or a social gathering of the church, there ought to be a thread, a ribbon that passes through that event, through that activity, that involves and reminds us and engages us in this matter of New Testament missions. Amen. It is not something we are, excuse me, it's not something we do, it rather is something we are. Amen. 
One man said you're either a missionary or a mission field, amen. And you'll have to decide which one you are, amen. But if we're saved by the grace of God, then I want us to get a hold of some things that'll help us to have an effective mission ministry in January as well as in September. In June as well as in September, amen. That it's not just something we did for three or four days, and we focus for three or four days, and then missions is something that's set on a shelf in our mind and in our home and at the house of God. Now, I know it's not here at university, but I want you to know that it can very easily become a side project to us. It's something we do because we're expected to do it, but I want you to know that's not God's plan for this thing. But He wants it to be what we do in our Christian life. And our existence evolves around missions, around reaching the world. Hey, that could be across the street. Amen. I couldn't help but to think about, brother, you said that when they get to South Korea, they're going to do door-to-door visitation. Now, that's what he said. We're going to do door. I believe him now. I believe him. Amen. Don't misunderstand me. But I chuckled. You know why I chuckled? I said it's going to take an elevator or some flights of steps. Amen. Because where we have to walk up a street, they're going to have to go up some steps. Amen. In all those high rises said, said that, you know, we talk about how many streets did you visit in your blitz campaign or your visitation. They don't talk like that over there. They don't want to know how many buildings you hit. Amen. Said, well, we had a good visitation night. We did two floors. <laughs> Amen. I like it that way. And by the way, y'all are not much different right here in Brookhaven. Amen. I don't know if y'all realized it or not, but uh, they're having a hard time seeing (laughs) y'all. Amen. (laughs) Having a hard time seeing y'all because y'all are over here. And uh, and all those great big buildings that have come up all the way around you. But I, I, I want us to have something in our hearts that'll help us to be effective in our mission program throughout the course of the year. Number one, in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, uh, we talked about if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Uh, and our first thought is this, that if we're going to be effective in missions, we have to be concerned for the lost. We've got to be concerned about those that do not know Jesus Christ And I'm going to be honest with you, that's the first step to revival. That's the first step to church growth. That's the first step to right faith promise. That's the first step to a life committed to missions. Amen. You've got to be concerned about the lost. And I'd caution any young man, any young lady, any individual that God began to stir their hearts toward missions, I'd caution them to step back and ask themselves the question, what is it that I'm concerned about for that individual? Amen? And and, and we can go around the world and find poverty that is unimaginable, living conditions that are unimaginable. Amen? We can go go those kind of places. Amen? Uh, We can go in places that are remote. We can go in places where... Uh, we are, they don't know what quote unquote civilization is amen we were talking about Chris Hanks at lunch today and I went out and preached for brother Chris he's in Grand Junction Colorado and he went out as a missionary and now he's just pastor he's no longer supported as a missionary but uh, I went out and preached for brother Chris and uh, Grand Junction's a fairly large city and I preach a lot in the west and a lot of them are remote and I got out there and he had two Walmarts man in Grand Junction one on both sides of town and they had just opened a Krispy Kreme Donuts in Grand Junction, Colorado. And the day we left, they opened a Chick-fil-A. Amen. I told him when I left, I said, I'm writing your supporting churches and tell him, you need to drop Chris Hanks. He's not on the mission field anymore. Amen. And, 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 and we can become concerned. Listen to me now. We can become concerned about their politics. We can come, become concerned about their poverty. We can become concerned about their living situation because they have lack of the good things of this life. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. Let me help you with something. Uh, there's always going to be the poor amongst us. Amen. 
And I, 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 I know when I say that, man, you're venturing down the political hot pit of today's politics, amen. I got over that a long time ago, amen. I didn't come to be political, but Jesus said. It's not what Brother Moore said, but it's what Jesus said. Jesus said that the poor you'll always have with you. Amen. Amen. And if we were to socialistically, if we were to pool all the resources of all of the wealth of the world and distribute it, can I let you in on the secret? 7.1 billion people in the world would be poor. Somebody help me now. Amen. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and we, we, we understand their poverty, but their poverty is not the concern that will keep you involved in missions next month. Amen. But the thing that's going to keep you involved in missions next month is being concerned for the lost. You may not be able to alter the temporal time of their physical life, you may not be able to eliminate their poverty or build them a house or take care of their physical needs. And where we can, we should. Somebody say amen. I'm not preaching otherwise. But I'm going to tell you something. We may not be able to fix what they have down here. But isn't it good news, Brother Braswell, that what we offer them is something that will fix what they're going to have over there. Can you imagine the orphan off the street that's lived a life in squander and has nothing that dies in that condition and goes to hell? I mean, that's going from something that's bad to something that's worse. And so you and I are not focused on the temporal, but we must be focused on the eternal. Amen. And so there's a concern for the lost. We have to know the condition of sinners. They're lost. They have no direction. They're misplaced. And they have no hope. We have to understand the condemnation of sinners. They are headed for judgment and hell. We must understand the complaint of sinners. They cannot help themselves. They do not know the way and they cannot find the way except some man should show them. How can I, said the Ethiopian eunuch, unless some man show me. That's what we're about in missions. We're about showing them uh, the good news of the gospel. And isn't that the right terminology? Isn't that the right expression? Now, I understand we're going to preach. You know that. Amen. I enjoyed eating tonight, but I'd rather preach than eat. Say amen. And I like to preach. But I'm going to tell you something. The reason that, that David and Angela Harper have been effective in Belize, working amongst the Mayans, the reason they've been effective down there uh, is because not only did they preach the truth, uh, but they lived the truth. Amen? I mean, not only was their message right, but their life backed up their message. Amen? That's what makes a difference. You've got to show them the gospel. They need to see what's done in your life because of the Savior. Amen. I, I don't want to re-preach that message, but it's just worth saying again. Amen. The complaint of the sinner, they can't find the way. They've got to have somebody to show them. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. Just what's on my mind. Amen. There is no such thing as distant missions. Amen. There's no such thing. Amen. You, I appreciate the internet and I think it's a tool we can utilize. I, I appreciate the mail and I think it's a tool we can utilize. But we're not going to win the world via the internet. Amen. We're not going to win the world via the internet. We're not going to win the world via email. We're not going to win the world via Facebook. Amen, or Twitter, or Tweet, or Peep, or anything else like that. You have to watch that. The Bible talked about those wizards that peep, amen. You've got to watch that stuff. Now, I don't know if Tweet and Peep are in the same category. We'll leave that for your discussion, amen. Amen. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is God built missions for personal contact. Amen. Personal contact. These franchise churches, you know what I'm talking about. They got a monster church somewhere. It's supposed to be a mega church. I thought it was a monster church, amen. And they got a preacher. 
Amen. And they video him and shoot him in by satellite so he can be in all their franchise churches. Now all that is, you know why people, do you know why, uh, do you know why McDonald's is a franchise operation? Because every McDonald's cheeseburger you buy down here on this street, the McDonald's corporation gets a portion of the proceeds. Everybody all right? Amen. I mean, that's why they let you use the McDonald's name because they want the proceeds from the sale of the McDonald's product, even over there in Korea, brother. Amen. I mean, they get the proceeds from it. And, uh, and God's not in franchise churches. Now, let me, let, brother, brother, uh, Brother Braswell, I, I, honest before the Lord, if they're in the remote regions of, A, of Africa or Alaska or the Northwest or somewhere, and we hadn't sent a missionary yet, and there's some believers and there's no preacher, and they can get a satellite feed, I'm not against that. That's not what we're talking about. Amen? But we're not going to have franchise churches on the mission field. It's going to take somebody that leaves where they are and goes where they are. Amen? Amen? And they got to go to where they are. And it's got to be personal. They got to see them. They got to touch them. And they got to look at them. And they got to watch them. Amen. That's why you don't walk up on the day you first arrive on the mission field and generally speaking see 50 or 60 converts. Right. Amen. Amen. That's why the biblical plan, man, I got to move on. But that's why the Bible's plan, if you'll study the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I believe that there's a chronological pattern for the establishment of a New Testament church laid out in those four Gospels. When you read Matthew's account, he said the first step is not to preach. Now that messes up the brethren. Y'all cut the video off. Amen, I need my meetings. Don't let them hear me say that. No, I'm just teasing uh, and, but that first step, he said that we are to go and teach all nations. We're not winning them. We're baptizing them. How do you become a part of this local New Testament church? You either come, you come by means of baptism. Now, you may have been baptized by faith, a church of like faith and order, and we recognize that baptism. We accept you in that fellowship. But baptism is that uniting thing that brings us into that local body, that local church. Amen. So he said when you get to the mission field, and, and, and God knows, brother you, I've never started a church in Korea. But when you get to the mission field, the biblical pattern for establishing that church said, go find some believers. Now I know that most of them are atheists or Buddhist in that province, but there's one or two. And you hunt them out, you smell them out, you flush them out, you locate them, amen? And then what do you do? They need to be disciples, so you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You baptize them which organizes them into a local assembly. Now we can get into the specifics of how that we go forth from our church, our home church, and until we constitute, we operate on the authority of our sending church, we baptize them into the body of our sending church until they're constituted and they become an indigenous body. Amen. That's just that's mission primer 101. Amen. And so Matthew said, start with the believers. And that's what Jesus was telling his disciples. I've been saving a lot of folks in the last three and a half years. Go find them. And when you find them, bring them together, organize them, disciple them, and lo, I'm with you all the way even until the end of the earth. Amen. Then we move over to Luke's, excuse me, to Mark's account where we find the first instruction to preach. He said, he, said, he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now that's important. Now I believe in crying aloud and sparing not and telling the house of Jacob their sin. But I'm going to be honest with you. The way we win people to Christ in any culture is to uplift Jesus. Amen. We uplift Jesus. Cry aloud and spare not and tell who? The house of Jacob their sin. Huh? Amen. I'm not against street preaching. I believe it's right. I, I think that we as Americans have lost it because we didn't practice it. Amen. But if you think going down on the street and pointing out men 
in their, fail, in their faults is going to win them to God, you're badly mistaken. Amen. I come through Kannapolis the other day. I walked out. Of, I'd been down to Walmart, and I was heading back over to Concord at Kannapolis on uh, Dale Earnhardt Boulevard. Busy, busy section, a lot of stores. I came, <coughs> I came up to the top of the hill. I came up to the top of the hill, and uh, there was some men out there holding signs and handing out gospel tracts. In a different era, they'd have been preaching, Brother Braswell, but you can't preach over 800 cars that are running, amen, and rushing traffic, so they were just holding signs and handing out gospel literature. And I liked what I saw because the, the, the verses that they had on those signs was not condemning the sinner. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn them because they're condemned already. Amen. Now, if you think I'm a compromiser, then go with me for a few weeks. And when I'm not in a missions conference and I'm in revival next week and the Holy Ghost said preach on sin, it's all holes barred, amen? I'm telling you, it's on because the Bible tells us we ought to instruct the people of God about sin. Amen. amen. But when we're trying to win the lost, it's not about their sin, it's about the fact they are sinners, Amen. And so he said, go preach the gospel. Go tell them that Jesus, what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I declare unto you the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins. The emphasis is not on our sins, but it's on his death. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. That's the gospel and the, the, the first step is to organize that body of believers. The second step is to evangelize the lost. Amen. And we do that, he said we do that by presenting them the gospel. Amen. The good news about Jesus, amen. Amen. That's exactly right. And then if you'll study Luke's account of the scripture, Luke's account said that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in my name beginning at Jerusalem. Amen? So you know what he said in Luke? He said you've got to tell them how to be saved. When you preach the gospel, you tell them that they ought to be saved. But when you preach repentance, you tell them how to get saved. You're still looking at one Baptist preacher believes except you repent, you'll perish. Amen. I believe you'll, rep I believe you'll repent in Korea or you'll perish. I believe you'll repent in Belize or you'll perish. I believe you'll repent in England or you'll perish. I believe you'll repent in Brookhaven or you'll, or you'll perish. Amen. And, and so what the scripture said was you bring them to the knowledge of the gospel they're already condemned and they know they have a need and they understand that the gospel is the need but he said the next step is how do you accept that? What do you do with that? We messed up in that regard. Amen. I'm not a one, two, three, repeat after me kind of preacher but I'm telling you somebody's got to step me in down the plan and pattern of God's salvation and tell them they see Christ died, but what do I do with it? Well, I'll tell you what the Bible said, repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, but you got to tell them. Amen. Amen. All right, so what have we done? We started with a nucleus of believers. We began evangelizing by presenting Christ. When men, reached under, when men were under Holy Ghost conviction, we preached repentance and remission of sins. Amen. And then we rolled into the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, he said, you start over and do it again. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And so what did he say? He said, when you start a mission church, uh, uh, brother, you, one of your, one, of your, uh, one of your number one priorities, I guess I'll put it that way, on your list of priorities, when you go over there and establish that church in uh, South Korea, when you go to establish that church, one of your number one priorities is to reproduce missions. Hey, Amen. Oh, it starts by getting a visitation group together. Hey, Amen. But it means going somewhere else. It means going across the border. It means going across the sea. Amen. Amen. Hey, it wouldn't be beyond the realm of God's possibilities to take Brother Yu and put him in South Korea as a missionary supported by churches in America. 
Let him establish a church over there, Brother Braswell. Let him disciple those believers. Let him win some new converts to God. Little old fella, 16, 18 years of age, comes walking down the aisle in Brother Hugh's service at the invitation, gives his heart and life to Jesus, gloriously saved by the grace of God, becomes faithful to the house of God, becomes a student of the word of God. In six months, the Holy Ghost puts his hand on him, whispers in his ear and says, I'm calling you to preach. He does that in Korea. Amen. He does that in Belize. Amen. And Brother Yu leads that young man and helps him get involved in a Bible college or some Bible training. And two years into his Bible college, the same Holy Ghost that convicted him for salvation and convicted him about preaching his service for the Lord sits down on him one night in a chapel service at the Bible college while somebody's preaching on Acts chapter 1 verse number 8 and the Holy Ghost says, you're going to be a missionary. Well, he automatically assumes, well, I'm already in Korea. Maybe I'll go to Japan or maybe I'll go to Cambodia or maybe I'll go to Vietnam or, or, or in, in, in his political realm, maybe I'll sneak across the border and be a missionary in North, Viet, uh, North Korea. Amen? I mean, no telling what God will do. But what if God said no? <laughs> no, he said, I think I'll send you to America. Huh? Because in the suburbs of Atlanta, there's a large Korean community and they need a gospel witness, amen. You say, preacher, that don't make any sense. It don't make any sense in your mind. And it don't make any sense in the accountant's book and it wouldn't make any sense in the government's logs. Well, actually, on second thought, the government probably like it, amen. But I'm telling you, it might be God's plan, amen. And he reproduces himself. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. How in the world are we going to do that? I don't know how in the world we could ever accomplish that. Acts chapter 1, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. Amen. Amen. You ain't going to do it until the after that. <laughs> Amen. That's why we got such an issue. We got people running around trying to do something for God before the after that. Amen. Amen. But he said, man, you can't do it until after that. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon you. After that, I'll endue you with power. After that, I'll provide you what you need to accomplish the task that I've given you to do. Amen. So real missions has a concern for the lost. We understand their condition, their condemnation, their complaint, but we know the cure. There's Christ. And then number two, I want you to get a hold of this now. And I'm, I'm watching the clock. But I'm preaching, amen. The preacher said preach, so I'm going to preach a few minutes. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, 17, and 18, what I just read for you this evening. Not only is our mission going to be effective when we are concerned for the lost, but it also will be effective when we are compelled by love. Amen. Hey, what motivates us? What motivates, what moves us in this matter of missions? If it is guilt, you won't make it a year in your faith promise commitment. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to be honest. I'm going to pick on Brother Hugh because he's the presenting missionary tonight. So anytime you're the presenting missionary, you get to be the subject of the conversation. Amen. <laughs> I'll be honest, Brother Hugh. Here you are going back to your people. You're going back to Korea. You're leaving America and going back to Korea. Now, my perception, my perception going back to Korea, is not as massive of a cultural shock. It's a westernized world. It's modern, high-rise buildings, lots of cars, traffic, just like Atlanta on a rainy Wednesday afternoon. Somebody say amen right there. And there's stores and things that are available because they're influenced by the West. Amen. Even at that said, and sometimes we've got a Spanish community here, and sometimes God will speak to a, a man that comes from uh, Mexico or Central or South America. He speaks Spanish, and he comes north, and he, he comes in, he gets a job or whatever his case might be, and the Lord saves him. And you know what happens sometimes? God puts his hands on some of those men and tells them to go back. They're not going back because there's a political influence. They're not going back. They're not going back because of a legal situation. 
They're going back because the word of God has come to them. The will of God has been revealed to them. And God said, go back to your people and win them to Christ. Amen. And can I tell you something? For a lot of men, and I've been in Mexico, I've been in much of Central America, I've been in some in South America, I know Brother Braswell has, and I'm just going to be honest with you, it would be a real sacrifice from a standard of living perspective, I can say that and not be offensive to you folks tonight, amen, I'm not trying to be hurtful, but it would be a sacrifice in standard of living to go back south of the border, amen, amen. But I'm going to tell you something, sacrifice or no sacrifice, whether it be as difficult or not as difficult, if Brother Yu is leaving, um, uh, uh, if he's leaving Hartsell, Alabama, I think he lives over that way toward Decatur, if, he li- if he's leaving Hartsell, Alabama and going back to South Korea because he feels guilty, he ain't going to be happy. Amen? Our motivation, our motivation can't be guilt. It can't be obligation. Our motivation in this matter of missions has got to be love. Amen. I mean love is the only thing that's going to withstand the test of time. He said hereby. Now look what he said. He said hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever this world's good and seeth his brother hath need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Verse 8 said, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I want you to write down three words about these three verses. Number one, when we consider being compelled by love, there's an example for us to follow. There's an example. For us to follow. Hereby we perceive the love of God. Amen. (laughs) Do you understand the example of the love that it's going to take for us to be effective in our mission endeavors? It's the example that we follow is the love of God. For greater love hath no man than this. That a man would lay down his life for his friends. Oh, and I'm glad he said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. Amen. Amen. You, you and I need to, we need to be compelled by love. Love ought to be the velvet cuffs that bind us to the will of God. Amen. Amen. The velvet cuffs that bind us to the will of God. We have the right example. Christ loved us. God loved us for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Christ so loved the world that he laid down his life. He gave his life a ransom for the souls of mankind. And you and I have him as our example. Then number one, we have an example. Number two, there's an expectation in these verses. He said, hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Now that's the pattern that we are to follow. So what are we supposed to do? He said, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Amen. Now wait a minute, he's not asking you to die, he's asking you to live, amen, he's asking you to live, Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2, brethren, I beseech you therefore by the mercy of God you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In fact, it's really not as difficult for us to lay down our lives as we think it might be because Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. (coughs) And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. God's not asking us to die for him. He's asking us to live. When we ask, when we reach this text where he says lay down our lives, he's not talking about taking our life, but he's talking about taking our living. 
Remember that little widow woman over there in the Word of God? I think it's in Matthew, uh, excuse me, in Mark's Gospel. Remember that little widow woman and the Bible said Jesus was over against the treasury watching men cast in their gifts and that little widow woman came in and she just had those two mites and, and the Bible said she throwed those mites in. Now you can believe whatever you want to believe. I believe she snuck in the side door. I believe her hair was up in a bun. I believe she leaned on a cane and I believe she had those two little mites tied up in a widow's handkerchief. Amen. Now, some of y'all been around long enough to know what I mean when I talk about a widow's handkerchief. Amen. You know how those little granny women came to church, amen, and they brought their offering and they tied it up in a handkerchief. I believe she snuck in the side door, didn't know anybody was watching, thought she'd just give her gift to the glory of God and go on her way, and she slipped up, dropped those two mites in. Jesus stopped the procession, called his disciples over and said, I want you to see this one. Now kings had been throwing in their crowns and men had been throwing in their fortunes and it didn't move him. But when that little widow woman came up, he said, she gave all she had. She gave it all. And in fact, the Bible said she gave her living. You see, she gave her life. We are represented by those two mites, but it was all she had. And when God speaks to our heart, he wants us to give him his, just give him our lives. Don't hold anything back. Give it all. Amen. That's right. Sacrifices don't get to make their own decision. They don't get to choose. They don't get to choose. They just get to lay there and be obedient to the one who's making the sacrifice. And God said, give yourselves a living sacrifice to God. Amen. Amen. And so there's an expectation. We're going to lay down our lives. Um, I told Melissa after I found out who authored the song, I wasn't going to quote it anymore, but I'm going to quote it anyway. But there's a song. There's a song, I'm not going to tell you who wrote it, but there's a song that's kind of popular in southern gospel circles today and several of our churches have sung it because of its popularity and it's a good song. But the second verse of that song says this in the lyrics of the song. It said, sometimes our wants and his desires don't always agree. Amen. Brother, Brother Braswell, you'd qualify for senior statesman tonight. Would that be a true statement? There will be some times in our lives when our, our, our want, not necessarily our sin, be careful about that. Amen? Hey, we're not even going to talk about sin. Bless God, if you've got open sin in your life, get it right and get it out. Amen? Amen. Amen. What else are we going to say about it? We're not going to come to terms on it. Get it right and get it out. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. There's some things that come between me and God that are not sin. Now, if I let them exist between me and God, they, they become sin. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm saying I want to do some good things and I want some right things in my life and some good things for my family. But sometimes my wants and his desires don't always agree. Amen. A fisherman might say, I want a new bass boat, but that's not God's desire for faith promises. Everybody all right? Amen. New hunting rifle, new fishing pole, new pair of shoes, you name it. You see, God has a way. He, our wants and his desires don't always agree, but we have to come to a place where we make our wants submissive to his desires. Amen. Amen. And so there's the expectation. There's the example. It's Christ in love, the expectation. We'll lay down our lives. Now, I kind of hesitated on verse 17 just for a moment, but I want to I want to touch on it. Let me, let me show you what the Word of God said. Remember that little that little that little rabbit I chased about the word of God, God meant what he said and said what he meant? Well, look at verse number 17. But whoso hath this world's good. Now in my King James Bible, that's a singular word. It's not a plural word. Brother Braswell, he didn't say the man that hath this world's goods. He said, the man that hath this world's good. Is that what it said? Can I tell you this passage is not about materialism? Amen. No more than that rich young ruler's salvation was dependent upon him selling what he had and giving it to the poor. He said, if thou be perfect. Still had to do his sin, didn't it? You see what he said? Look. This passage of scripture doesn't say the man that hath this world's goods 
and he sees his brother in need and shuts up those bowels of compassion. That would be our physical possessions. That would be the money in your pocket or your bank account or the house you live in or the car you drive. The wealth that you possess. That's not what he's talking about. He said, but if you have this world's good, my Bible said there's none good. In fact, there's only one who's good. And who is he? His name is Jesus. That's the only good in this world. The only good in this world is Christ. And what he said in this text, plainly spoken, Brother Ledford, is if you have this world's good, if you have what's good in this world, if you have Jesus and you see this need, this world has a need, but wait a minute. Brother you, he's not talking about their poverty. No, no. He's talking about their spiritual depravity. Amen. I came in Tuesday evening from Marietta and probably to my demise, I used to work downtown, but I hadn't been downtown in a long time. And, and uh, so I followed my GPS's instruction, jumped off at, jumped off at, uh, and came down West Paces Ferry. <laughs> I know. I, I really, it may, in the long run, it may not have been too bad, much worse than it could have been. But I hadn't been down through there in a long time. And when I got on, West, I said, West, 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 West. oh, that's where the governor's mansion's at. That, that, that's, where, that's where the rich folks live. Y'all all may live on West Paces Ferry, but that's where the rich people in Atlanta live. I mean, those are not little bitty cabins. Now, I know the Woodruffs have got some summer homes down there, but it's not, it's not little bitty houses. Those are millions and millions of dollars in mansions. Amen. Can I say this? There's not any poverty on West Paces Ferry. Amen. I mean, the caretakers that do the loans are not even poor down there. <laughs> Somebody help me now. Amen. <laughs> but they are so needy. Behind their security fences and manicured lawns and beautiful floral arrangements, behind their brick encasements, they are so needy because they don't have this world's good. Amen? They don't know the Savior. And the Bible said, the Bible simply said that we can't see their need. No, 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 not their need for food or their home for a house. Oh, but their need for a Savior. Amen. That's why your missionary brings his laptop and sets it up here and lets it scroll through the pictures. And you begin to see, you begin to see the pictures that are there of faces of individuals. He's not showing you that picture so you can see ten roofs. He's not showing you that picture so you can see men that don't have much. He's showing you that little boy's face so you can see he has a need. And the need he has is for Jesus Christ. Because if somebody doesn't reach that little fella with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to leave this life of need and end up in hell. And it, the Bible simply said, if we really love God, and if we really know the love of God, and we see that need, and we possess the good, amen, then there's no love about us. We can't shut up our bowels of compassion. We can't contain the gospel and hold it to ourselves. Amen. There's my Bible. I'm trying to preach out of one. You're obligated to get involved in missions not because you have a good paying job. We're obligated to get involved with missions, not because we're Americans. That's why I travel to Mexico and preach mission conferences, and I travel to Northern Ireland and preach mission conferences, and I travel to Africa and I preach to mission conference. Because you're not obligated to missions because you have a car or you have a house. You're obligated to missions because you have what's good. Amen. 
here. He said, we have what's good. And he says in verse number 18, my little children, now he's going to talk about meeting that need. Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Huh? Let us love in deed and in truth. The deed is going and giving. The truth is the gospel. That's what sets men free. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. We got to tell them. We got to tell them. We got to tell them. We'll have effective missions because we're concerned for the lost, because we're compelled by love, because we're committed to the labor. Matthew chapter 7 said, the, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers. If you'll read that text, you'll find there's a serving principle. There's some work involved in reaching people for Christ. There's a supplicating principle. He said, pray. Well, let me help you. There's a sovereign principle. He's the Lord of the harvest. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's the Lord of the harvest. He, he still got the control. Amen. He controls what University Baptist Church needs. He controls what David Harper needs. He controls what Brother You needs. He controls what the Moore family or the Braswells need. He's the one that's in charge. He's the Lord of the harvest. And by the way, he said if you need something, just ask. I'm the Lord. <laughs> that's 45 minutes of preaching and two and a half minutes. Here's point number four. If you're going to have effective missions, you'll be concerned for the lost, compelled by love, committed to labor, and you'll have to be confident in the Lord. Luke chapter 18, verse 27 said, All things are possible with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 8 tell us that we can know the power of God. Let me read that verse. He said, But this I say, we which soweth, <coughs> excuse me, he said, for this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Talking about being confident now. All things are possible with God. We know the power of God. And we have the promise of God. Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That promise, by the way, is in direct response to faithful mission giving. Talking to missionaries that go to a foreign field and introduce men to the truth who have never known truth. They may go to a country that's predominantly Catholic and minister amongst those that were raised in Catholicism. And they may go amongst a Mayan people that were raised in the traditions of their ancestors or um, Buddhist or Confucius or Catholicism or, 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 or Muslim communities, wherever the case might be. You'll not be in missions very long and you'll not work with missionaries very long until you hear the tragedy of missions. And this is what I mean. You'll not be in missions very long until you'll hear a missionary tell the story about a heartbreak, a real heartbreak because he won a young man or a young lady to Christ. They really got saved. They began to become disciples of Christ and they began to study the word of God. And then one day, now free from that religious, religious bondage that they've known all of their existence, one day, Brother Braswell, it dawns on them. Grandma and Grandpa went to hell. My aunts and uncles went to hell. They get a burden for those that are living and they know they can reach them. But then one day it dawns on them, brother, 
David that they can't change the destiny of those that have died before even if they didn't know and the missionary will have to answer this question when a broken hearted young man or woman looks at him tears rolling down his face and says how long have you had the truth And in our country, Brother Carl, he says, well, we were founded on a Christian principle. We're a Christian nation. So we've had the truth for all of our existence, 2000, uh, 225 years. We've had the truth. And there's a long pause and a great silence and then a voice that's almost angry but at least broken looks up and said, why did it take you so long to get here? If we'd only known, if we'd only known. My grandpa, my daddy's side loved me. He died when I was five so I don't have a lot of personal memories of granddaddy Moore. He was never a professing Christian, never went to church, never exhibited any knowledge of God. Now the preacher that preached his funeral, according to my daddy, said that he had a deathbed conversion, but my dad said, I didn't know anything about that. And he said, I hope I can see him in heaven, but as far as I know, he died and went to hell. And this is what he'll say. This is what my grandmother used to say. He sure did love you. It's a long story. You don't want to hear all of it. But I was the last more. I'm the namesake. My dad had one brother and he had two girls. And then my dad came along and had one boy. I'm it glad the Lord gave us a little boy took a little pressure off somebody say amen right there carry that namesake on but I'm a boy I have a clock wrapped up in paper it doesn't work it needs to be worked on and it'd be an expensive thing to repair but when my granddaddy died and he died in 71 the clock was over a hundred years old and he bypassed all the rightful heirs and said that's Dwayne's because he loved me he had a bunch of grand boys, but they weren't moors. It wasn't right. I'm not saying, sir, it was right, but Daddy said it wasn't an unusual thing for him to come by the house, pick me up, and take me to town, and buy me a suit or a toy. I was the namesake. And my granny said one day, she said, I got saved at 7, and I started preaching at 10. I've never done anything but what you see me doing tonight. And uh, my grandmother said, my daddy said on numerous occasions, I wonder if he'd have lived just a couple of years. Would you have been able to reach him? Now, I couldn't control that. But if we could just get Brother Yu to South Korea, I'd just about sent you to South Africa, brother, just right there on the tip of my tongue, amen. But if we can get Brother Yu to South Korea a little quicker, maybe some little boy won't have to say grandpa went to hell because he didn't know he didn't know he didn't know oh we got to be effective in this thing and we got to reach them for Jesus amen we show our love through our giving and our going and our praying for his glory